you. Tonight we are thrilled to have with us one of our own, Brother Stephen Jones. How many are thankful for the ministry of Brother Stephen and Sister Rachel Jones? Amen. Some of you that may be new around here, Stephen and Rachel were both raised in this church as young people and uh, served in on the ministry team for our young people, the ministry youth staff, and then a particular season in their life, they went to help plant a home missionary work with uh, Brother Stephen Long in Montana. Uh, Brother Stephen, upon completing that, came back to Sacramento and uh, went to work in the political arena uh, under uh, Governor Schwarzenegger there in the office of the governor uh, downtown and was on a successful path of business and connections and uh, the call of God was heavy in his life and things began to develop in Roatan, Honduras and uh, again the hand of God came upon their family and they stepped out by faith and again going to help brother and sister Mom in the work in Roatan. It wasn't but about, I guess, six or seven months, if I remember right, that Brother Malone had a heart attack and uh, was unable to continue to stay in Honduras. So here at the time was a young man and his wife in a foreign country with a language they did not speak or understand, uh, left with responsibility, who was not a building contractor, but left with the responsibility of building and completing what is now the Hope Corps Intensive Training Week Training Center, and uh, which was probably, if that building was built uh, here in the United States to the specs, I'm guessing, Bishop Wilson, what would you say that building in California? Probably $2 million if we were to build that in California. So here's a, uh, here's a young man that is not a builder, that is not a contractor, that takes on that project and completes it. And then uh, God so ordained, they wound up being full-time missionaries in Honduras. And they are again uh, in a building program nearing the completion of that facility. And I, I hope, I've got a suspicion he's gonna show us a, a little bit of update on where they are in the building coming up on the dedication of that facility very soon. I'm looking forward to being able to be there for that. Uh, but when, when we talk about the ministry of this family, I don't know if you know, Honduras is considered the most dangerous country in the world, not at war. So if you take out the war countries where there is war going on, Honduras is the number one uh, most dangerous country. And the island of Roatan has a very high level of HIV. Uh, and Honduras is also the second poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere. So when you think about where Stephen and Rachel could have been, what they could have been doing, they have walked away from the comforts of home and friends and family and a career path. But don't feel sorry for them because they're doing exactly what they feel they're supposed to do. They never gripe, they never complain. They celebrate what God is doing in their life. And he's not gonna tell you, but let, let me just tell you. I've been going to Honduras, well, I've been going to Honduras since I was a kid with my parents, uh, working in ministry there since I was just a small child. Uh, it, it's not a place that's comfortable, okay? I think in the last, 150 years, there have been 300 either civil wars or revolutions or rebellions in that country. Okay? Last week, they burned the Capitol. Okay? And I could go through a whole list of things. It's the topsy turvy, wild, wild west. And they're on that island. And God, into all of the chaos, all the confusion, God took these. California Valley kids dropped them in the jungle between the mountains and the sea and said, go to work. And when you see, I hope you got some pictures, when you see what they're building, there is no other church 
no other temple, no other gathering place, anywhere on that island that compares to what is being built there right now. I'm, I'm telling you, you could put it on any street corner in Sacramento and would look and say, that's a beautiful place. And guess what, folks? That's your kids doing that. Stephen, Jones, we love you here at TRC. Come on, would you welcome your son of the gospel, Stephen Jones. Hey, one more time, let's clap our hands to the Lord all over this sanctuary. Come on, he's the one worthy of praise tonight. Come on, would you stand on your feet? Would you give him the best hand clap of praise that you've given him all night? I know it's manifest Tuesday, but why don't we exalt the King of all kings? We're here tonight, you might as well glorify his name. You might as well exalt his name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I am so, so privileged to be home with, with all of you tonight on, uh, on Manifest Tuesday and uh, be with the people who have influenced our lives the most. And uh, I, uh, I, was, I was thinking just before service how interesting it is the way God puts things in your spirit because tonight you're doing manifest and without even realizing it, we started doing Wednesday night manifest in our own way in Honduras and Wednesday nights our whole church comes together and every Wednesday somebody else brings food and feeds the whole church and they fellowship and we open up the Bible and we study the word of God together and it's becoming my favorite night of the week. And here I am, I get to slip in on a Tuesday night at home and enjoy the same spirit of fellowship and unity. And I, I'm so thankful to be here tonight with, with God's, God's people. And uh, happy anniversary to my pastor and my pastor's wife. I'm always so motivated to have a better marriage when I see the example in front of me. And I honor them today, Bishop and Sister Wilson, who, um, Brother Wilson will be preaching the first service of our dedication in our new building. And, uh, Brother Wilson, I went into church the other day. Right now we're working. And I walked into the sanctuary and it was so hot. I've never been anywhere hotter than that sanctuary. And we don't have the money for air conditioning. We don't. But I told myself, I will not be the reason that Brother Wilson dies in Honduras. <laughs> he is not going to die in my church. And so let me tell you, I went out and I spent $12,000 and I did not have to make sure that he comes back to Sacramento in three weeks. So it's going to be air conditioning. 72 degrees. It'll be like camp meeting. The check is going to be a little different. We're going to pay you in Lampiras. I am, I really am so honored that he's coming. And uh, the Youngs, Brother Wilson, the whole family. And uh, many of you are coming. You've texted me or called me and let me know that you're coming to celebrate with us in a few weeks. And that really means so much to me. Because I know you don't have to come. You've already given and sacrificed in so many ways. Uh, I'm truly honored that, that some of you are planning to, to come. That church would not be what it is without the collective effort uh, of this church. And I'm in debt to many, many people in this room in ways I, I could never repay. And uh, one in particular person that I'm incredibly indebted to is Brother Babylon, uh, who has given of his own resources and then given of his company's resources. And then he sent his baby girl to help us for a year. And uh, Brother Babylon, I want you to know we really appreciate that. We sacrifice him for the world. 
I love you. I love your family. I'm so thrilled about what God is doing here at TRC and then in Dixon, TRC West, Brother Boston and Sister Haley, Roseville, Brother Young was sharing stories about Mexicali and Ensenada today with me. And uh, I'm just so excited to be a part of this church and be, be a small part of what God created here and hope to replicate that on a little island out in the middle of nowhere and, uh, and have incredible revival. Let me show you a quick video and a picture of the current state of our sanctuary. This was about a week ago, and so things have changed significantly since this picture. Um, but we've made tremendous progress. And uh, what you're looking at is I'm standing in the back of the sanctuary. And this picture probably doesn't do it justice, but you can see about 300 people in there. And in the very back, you can hardly tell, but there's a baptistry. Now, that may not mean much to you because you've got one here and you use it every week. But I've, I've had to baptize 300 people in the ocean. And uh, it's fun at first. But after 250 people coming out salty, tripping over seaweed and stepping on sea urchins, it loses its luster. And so I'm fixing to baptize people in that warm water. And I'm not going to get wet anymore. Praise God. I, I think I'm more excited about that than anything. Hallelujah. But here, here's a little video. Brother Chad sent me this today. We're putting paint on the walls. There's a little storage bodega in the back. That's how you come in through the back of the church. Offices, Sunday school classrooms, bathrooms, our little sound room, media area, emergency exit. They're installing windows this week, but in two weeks, this will be occupied with 300 people lifting up the name of Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. And we've been able to build that building debt free. And we don't owe anybody any money. Amen. I told Brother Young and Brother Wilson back in December, had I known it was going to be this difficult to build a building, I probably never would have started. And uh, I'm sure that Brother Gordon back there, he's nodding his head. Brother Wilson, Brother Young, and others that were actively involved in building this building, had we known how hard it was going to be to build it, we probably never would have started. But God has this way of withholding information. He doesn't tell you how difficult it's going to be because he doesn't want you to stop before it's time to start. And when it gets too difficult, I find out that my strength is made perfect in my weakness. And God gets the glory. You're looking at a building. I didn't build that. God built that building. I didn't pay for that building. God paid for that building. I'm just the steward of God's resources. Hallelujah. We are standing tonight in the blessings of God. What a privilege it is to do the work of God. Amen. Brother Young said, don't feel sorry for me. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I, uh, I, I pray if God will let me that I'll never have to leave Honduras. I pray that if God will let me, and I know God's listening right now, I hope that I never have to and I hope God lets me get a boat. And I hope I never have to leave. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. A nice fishing boat. God, if you're listening, eight foot wide. 31 feet long. 250 horsepower, four-stroke Yamahas. Amen. That's what I need to do the work of God. God, I'm sacrificing. <laughs> Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 11. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 11. My mom and my dad are here. And uh, nobody believes in me more than my mom and my dad. And, uh, I am so thankful for them and I love them. They're coming to 
spend some time with us in a few weeks. And uh, my boys cannot wait to show you all the scorpions <laughs> in our house, in the bedroom you're going to be sleeping in. <laughs> and I'm not joking. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 11. If you're there, say amen. The Bible says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. But ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. So let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Amen. And for just a few minutes, it's 8.07 on this Tuesday night. I want to talk to you about salt and sacrifice. Salt and sacrifice. Everybody say, God bless the word. Amen. Our text uh, takes us to a famous Sermon on the Mount. The sermon was delivered in the slopes of Capernaum. This enormous crowd has followed Jesus um, up the side of this mountain. And they are attracted to him because of the things that he has done. But they, these people were in for a shock because the kind of kingdom that Jesus was about to describe to them had never entered into their wildest imagination. He starts this sermon by, by declaring, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. His first demand, or some scholars call these the Beatitudes. His first demand is a demand for genuine humility. The second beatitude deals with our spiritual nakedness and our moral bankruptcy in the world. The third says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The fourth beatitude tells us that we are to aim at being righteous. The fifth, the sixth, the seventh beatitudes deal with how we respond when dealing with cruelty and corruption and conflict. Jesus says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Notice Jesus did not say, Blessed are the peacekeepers. But Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers. This is the difference between an apostolic born-again believer and a police officer. A police officer keeps the peace, but an apostolic born-again believer makes the peace. If you've been filled with the Holy Ghost evidence by speaking in other tongues, you have the creative spirit of Jesus Christ within you, and you have the authority to walk into any room in your life and make the peace in the room. You can walk into a room that's suffering from Peace in the church. We make peace in 
peace in the hospital. We make peace in the courtroom. We've got the spirit of Christ in us. Hallelujah. Somebody shout amen. The eighth beatitude has to do with dealing and handling persecution. Jesus knew that his message would be unpopular. He, he knew that it would be, be the, the, the catalyst for his own death and the bitter hostility towards his followers. Instead of being astonished at the world's reaction to our gospel, he says we are to expect it. He said you should not be surprised by persecution or by the marginalization of the church by governments or when your worldview conflicts with the worldview of a college professor or the constant attacks against the ministry or heresies that make their way into the church, you should not be surprised by that. Now, when someone does not like your face on your, your post on Facebook, that is not persecution. If you don't get invited to the birthday party, that is not persecution. Now, it seems like every day there is a, there's a new reason why we should, we, we should not like social media. But I'll give you one of the reasons why I have, I have come to the conclusion that I love social media. I love social media because at the judgment day, nobody is going to have a good excuse for their prayerlessness. Because now even your phone records how much time you spend on social media. <laughs> your prayerlessness has no excuses anymore. We need to be a praying people. We need to be a people that find time every day to fall on our face and seek the presence of God. Instead of cycling through your phone and looking at everybody else who has a better life than you, you need to make a better life for yourself by falling on your face and seeking the presence of God. We need to be a praying people. We need to pray until it breaks. We need to pray until it releases. We need to pray until something changes. We need to be a prayer-saturated people. Nothing makes me more proud than pastor the church in Honduras when I get text messages from young ladies that ask me, Pastor, is the church open right now? And I say, no, but I can unlock it for you. We go down there, we unlock the door, and girls are, and young boys are coming to the church at all hours of the day, and not just praying for 15 or 20 minutes. I go back three hours later, and they're still on their face praying. Can I just tell you the catalyst for an apostolic revival is a praying people. We ought to be a praying people that know how to touch God and know how to pray until things break and things change and marriages are restored and healing is given. We need to be praying people. We don't need to be intimidated by the criticisms of our world. We don't need to be dismayed by the fault finding of our world. We don't need to be horrified by the pot shots against the church. They say the church is old fashioned. They say the church is out of touch and behind the times and antiquated. And we are to expect those things Jesus said and walk worthy of our calling because Jesus did not come to make a fashionable church. But this church is not fashionable, but it will heal your brokenness. This church is not trendy, but it will free you from addiction. This church is not silent, but it will save your soul from a burning hell. Jesus did not come to be full. He did not come to earn popularity. He was not here to garner your election. He came to preach to the captives. He came to set at liberty them that are bound. He came to bind up the brokenhearted. And I don't preach for the world's approval. I don't do this for their applause. I don't do this to get their affirmation. I don't do this for the world. I don't do this for the things of this world. I do this to please God. I'm here to please God. I lift my hands to please God. I bow my knees to please God. I live this life to please God. Hallelujah. Since we arrived in Rotan, really dating back six or seven years, 
When Brother Wilson and Brother King and Brother Young walk through that door, we've had people tell us, you can't build a church here. Come on. These people are unstable. These people are entrenched in traditions and customs. These people are too Catholic. These people are too prejudiced. These people won't accept you in Honduras. You're a white guy. <laughs> soy gringo, pero soy catracho. In this country, Brother Young has already mentioned, we've had over 300 political coups. Last week, they set the U.S. Embassy on fire. These people are too rebellious. That's just a vacation spot, they said. On and on, we've, we've had preachers tell us you can't build a church on that island. We've had people, preachers on the island, local preachers say, Jesus, they people are in false doctrine. They've kicked us out of taxis for being baptized in Jesus' name. They've excluded us from their ministry roundtables for preaching in Jesus' name. They are actively working against our church. But while all of this is going on, we continue to have revival. We continue to see people filled with the Holy Ghost. We continue to see people set free. Spanish people are getting the Holy Ghost. English people are getting the Holy Ghost. White people are getting the Holy Ghost. Black people are getting the Holy Ghost. Every nation, every tongue, every culture, every... Oh, we've seen over 300 people baptized in Jesus' name. Why? Because persecution cannot stop God's church. You can fight us, but you can't stop God's people. There is no weapon. There is no government. There is no legislation.
you are speaking in other tongues. And in Honduras tomorrow night at Bible study, there's going to be people you've never met. And you may never meet. But they're going to be speaking in other tongues. Because there is a universal language that connects the church all over the world. And you've got to speak in other tongues. If you want to be saved, you've got to speak in tongues. If you want to go to heaven, you've got to speak in tongues. Effective in our world. Maximize your time on earth. There's the things that you've got to get. He said, You don't have time to meander through life just aimlessly wandering, but you've got to channel in some focus and get some things right now. Do you want to know why life is powerful and life has meaning? Because one day life expires. That's what gives life meaning. It makes life powerful. That's why we feel so compelled to capture the, the moment on a camera. Because one day, life expires. And that's why, why you pull out the phone and record your son riding the bicycle for the first time. Because time is fleeting. And life is a vapor. And that's what gives life meaning and makes life so powerful. And God says, did you redeem your time? Did you maximize your time? Are you utilizing what God gave you? Are, you? are you making the best use of the tools and the assets that God has put in your hand? It's 2019. And Brother Wilson, you've been preaching my whole life that God is coming. And I, I believe it now more than I've ever believed it before. We don't have time to wait. There, there is an expiration date on this thing. This thing is wrapping up. And if I'm going to be effective in the kingdom of God, I've got to be busy right now. I've got to be busy right now. That's why when Jesus went looking for disciples, he did not leave it out of your Bible on purpose. The Bible says he found people that were willing to drop their nets and straightway follow Jesus. Because we need people that sense the urgency of this thing. That recognize there is a time restraint on this gospel. And we don't have time to fight and bicker and complain over petty arguments. We've got to get collective and do the work of God right now. You don't have time to get your life in order. You need to get busy right now. You don't have time to build up a savings account. You need to do it right now. You don't have time to get a 401k and build a big house and build a family. You've got to get busy doing the work of God right now. Oh, God! Hallelujah. Jesus says you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Then he says something that convicted me. He said, but if salt has lost its savor, when shall it be salted? It's thenceforth good for nothing, but men cast it on the ground and they trample it under their feet. And one translation of John says, if salt loses its savor or its flavor or become, it, it become flat, it's good for nothing. He said, it would ruin a manure pile. He said, if, if salt that has lost its saltiness goes into the compost pile, it would ruin the compost. He said the life of a born again believer that loses its salt is no longer even able to contribute to the war. He said you would ruin the fertilizer that would normally be used to grow vegetables and fruit and be productive. He said if you've lost your saltiness, you would ruin what would other, otherwise Profitable. We throw rotten milk in the compost pot. We throw moldy vegetables in the compost pot. We throw rotten fruit in the compost pot. He says, you are the salt of the It's not something that you do. Being the salt of the earth is who you are. And a saltless life is a life that lacks conviction. A saltless life is a life that is uninterested in shouldering the burden of the local church. 
A soulless life is a wasted life. It's a squandered life. It's a fruitless life. We are the salt of the earth. Salt. We see it for just. We see it for just. I'm not going to do much more. I promise you that. Salt or rock salt, or commonly called table salt, is essential for life. And the earliest dating of salt mining goes back several thousand years. We've heard things in our life related to salt. We've heard things like phrases like seated above the salt. I don't know if you've ever heard that. It's an old English phrase for where you place an honored guest. Salt was so valuable that you would place your honored guests at the table closest to the salt. And what you were communicating without saying anything with your words was that you are so honored in this house. We are going to give you the easiest access to the salt. Seated above the salt. It reflected prestige and honor. You've heard things like, worth your weight in salt. You ever heard that before? Roman soldiers were often paid in salt. In fact, the word salary derives from the word salt. And so you got paid according to how much you weighed. For some of us, that would be a good thing. Some of y'all will be broke. Some of y'all will be rich. We've heard things like salting a wound, which was a way of stopping infection in the army and military at war. We would put salt in a wound, which was very painful, but it would, it would slow the infection and allow time for proper medical treatment. We've heard things like, she's being salty. No, that's not really that relevant. I don't know how to describe that. <laughs> but salt was absolutely necessary for a thriving society. It became a booming industry in the 1800s in the bloody Civil War. Salt workers were paid in salt. They requested to be paid in salt because the value of the dollar was depreciating during the war. The only thing that was not depreciating during the war was the value of salt. And they said, this war is getting worse and worse, and we can't depend on the dollar. So don't pay us in dollars. Pay us salt. Amen. And I, we're living in a world right now that is increasingly becoming more and more evil. We're calling good evil and we're calling evil good. And there is depravity and, and, and decadence all around us. And, and, and we're seeing this happen right before our very eyes. And while all of this is happening, the value of our world is going down. But the value of the apostolic church is on its way up. The degradation of politics and public figures is allowing for the intensifying of the church. The deterioration of our culture is only revealing to us the value of an apostolic born-again believer is going up. <laughs> That's why we don't need less prayer. We need more prayer. We don't need less revival. We need more revival. Because everywhere we look, the value of the world is going down. But the value of the apostolic church going up, so give me revival, and give me prayer meetings, and give me more missionaries, and give me more preachers, and give me more conventions. I want, I want you to know at the, at, the, at the very end of this message that I'm not preaching for your applause tonight. I'm not even preaching for your approval or your affirmation. I, I don't even need you to stand up and clap your hands. I can preach to, I'm a missionary to foreign country. I preach to empty chairs all week. I don't need that to impress me. I am here and I am not going to apologize. But we, we need to impact the environment and the world around us. If I do nothing else tonight, I want to awaken you to the reality that God is demanding something of us in 2019. God wants us to give more. God wants us to sacrifice more. God wants us to pray more. God wants us to go further. God wants us to reach harder. God wants us to have an apostolic 
life in the ministry of Jesus Christ. We need to salt the environment around us. Come quickly. Amen. Napoleon, great military mind that he was, discovered that the war without salt is a desperate situation. In his retreat from Russia, he needed salt to feed the soldiers. But he was out of salt. He needed salt to tend to the cavalry. But he was out of salt. He needed salt to care for the cattle to carry the supplies. But he was out of salt. Thousands of soldiers died of minor injuries because there was no salt for their wounds. The war that Napoleon fought was not lost because of a lack of artillery. It was not lost because of a lack of weapons or ammunition or gunpowder or manpower or ingenuity or intelligence. It was lost because of a lack of salt. The weapons of our warfare are carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of spiritual strongholds. And we are in a war. And if we have no salt, can I say it this way? If we lose our apostolic identity, and we lose our separation from the world. Or we lose our demonstrative worship, our radical faith, our willingness to sacrifice, our willingness to be broken before God. If we lose our flavor, we lose the war. And people in our church will die from minor things if we lose the salt. Our ministries will crumble if we lose the salt. Our young people become carnal if we lose the salt. Churches will stagnate if we lose the salt. When people get around me, they should be refreshed by a salted life. When people get around me, they should feel their faith lifted by a salted life. The apostle Paul wrote in Colossians 4 verse 6, he says, Let your, your speech be always with grace, seasoned. With salt. In other words, he said, let the words of your mouth be seasoned with salt. Or pure. Let the meditation of my heart be seasoned with salt. Let the friends that I keep be seasoned with salt. Let the dreams that I dream be seasoned with salt. Let everything that I do be seasoned with salt. God, I want my motives to be pure. I want my heart to be pure. I want my mouth to be pure. I want the things that I allow to entertain me to be pure. I want the music that goes into my ears be seasoned with salt. I want the places that I go to be seasoned with salt. Yeah. Salt and sacrifice. During the Civil War, Tallahassee Sentinel warned its readers of the folly of buying dark impure salt that was being brought along the coast in boats. This is a direct quote from the newspaper. Southern Confederacy in Atlanta, August 28, 1862. Quote, This salt will not save your meat, but spoil it. It will not heal your wounds, but infect them. It will not hydrate your horses, but will dehydrate them. They charge six and eight dollars a bushel, but it were better to give twelve or more per bushel and get the real thing than to buy that which is comparatively worthless at half the price. Stay away from cheap, impure salt. I'm preaching on this Tuesday night to awaken us to the reality that we need to be acquainted with pure salt. I am not the Tallahassee Sentinel, and this is not the Civil War, but the urgency is still the same. 
I want to preach to you tonight about the dangers of fake salt. Real salt comes from a life that has been entirely consecrated to God, both publicly and privately. Real salt comes out of a young man or a young woman who puts God first in their life. Real salt is mined out of the altar of consecration in a holy place. Real salt is pure, uncontaminated, and unspotted by the world. You need to beware of, of other salts that look like the real thing, but, but offer something at half the price. You need to beware of a form of godliness that denies the power thereof. You need to beware of those people that offer you Jesus, but it's got the flavors of the world. You've got to beware of those that are embracing a kingdom of this world, but preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. It may look like the real thing, but it's not the real thing. It may be advertised like the real thing, but it's not the same. This song won't heal you. This song won't save you. This song won't protect your marriage. This song won't save your children. It'll spoil them. It'll infect them. And it'll cost you more. It would be better for you to pay double than to give, get that which is comparatively worth it at half the price. Because real salt demands a high price. I know this is just Tuesday night and it's just me. Can I preach that there is a high price to a high cost? Real salt never goes on sale. You gotta pay full price. You gotta give everything to God. The preacher pays full price. The single mother pays full price. The biggest tithe payer pays full price. The lowly bus king pays full price. Everybody pays full price. And that is everything you have. If you want to have real revival in your life, you got to pay full price. It's tough putting my kids on FaceTime with their grandparents 4,000 miles away and then not understand why they can't reach through the phone and touch them. But that's the high price. That's the price you pay to see 300 people baptized in Jesus' name. And the burgeoning of an apostolic life. Yeah, it's tough and there's, there's sacrifice, but if I want my life to be salted, and I want the real thing, there is sacrifice involved. And the world is trying to remove sacrifice from the gospel. And make it all about easy believism. But Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, foxes have holes, birds have a nest, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. In other words, there is some discomfort involved in this. But if you want a real anointing, and you want a real breakthrough, and you want to see real things happening, you've got to pay full price. There is a real danger in living a casual life for Jesus. Living without salt. Nobody in our Bible was casual about anything. Webster finds casual as relaxed, unconcerned, not regular, not permanent. If they were used by God, they were not casual about anything. Can I tell you that radical Christianity is normal Christianity. Yeah. Let's, not, let's not separate the two. Radical faith is the only kind of faith. Salt. 
Stephen was stoned in the streets for preaching this. There was nothing casual about that. When John was deserted on the island, Patmos dipped in hot oil and left for dead. There was nothing casual about that. When John was beat and put in prison, there was nothing casual about that. And we are not going to survive living for God, living casual lives for Jesus. God, I want my life to be something and pure. I don't know what they have playing the same. Casual Christianity is content with mediocre altar calls. Casual Christianity is content with letting the pastor do evangelism by himself. Casual Christianity is okay with lukewarm youth groups and, and, and happy with partial deliverance. Casual Christianity is content with people confessing with their mouth and believing in their heart. Never being full of the Holy Ghost. And this is just where I'm at in Honduras. Surrounded by so many stateside ministries that come to do humanitarian work. And I've often wondered, God, I wish we had more resources to do more humanitarian work for this island. God convicted me and said, I am not a humanitarian. God didn't come to put backpacks on children. God didn't come to feed the homeless. Now we do those things and they are so important. We are blessed to be a blessing. And we put 50 backpacks on kids that didn't have them this year. And we feed people in our church every Wednesday. And we're going to keep doing it building homes for people and putting roofs on churches or on people's homes that have leaky roofs. But that will not save them. Nobody is going to get to heaven when I put a backpack on their child. But let that backpack be the conduit that brings them to a red hot apostolic prayer meeting and gets them full of the Holy Ghost. Jesus did not come to do humanitarian work. He came to save their soul. We don't need to be casual about this. We need to get on fire about this. Let's touch bus kids. Let's put backpacks on the poor. Let's go to the soup kitchens. But let that be the door that ushers them to an apostolic prayer meeting. Let that be the conduit that brings them to revival. Oh, we don't need casual Christians. We need intentional, spent, but premeditated, full time. Concerned, earnest, wholehearted, committed, resolute, determined people to walk a salted life. And I'll close with this. In Leviticus chapter 2, God gives explicit instructions. If you want to stand all over them. God gives explicit instructions in the book of Leviticus for how to prepare a sacrifice. Unblemished. Couldn't have a broken tooth. Couldn't have a scab. Couldn't have a cracked hoof. Couldn't have a squirrely eye. That's what the Bible says. Had to be perfect. A dove, a bullock, a goat, whatever you brought. God says, I want you to bring it to me. And that's the requirement. But there is another level of consecration. And he says, for those that want to go further, he says, I want you to salt the sacrifice. Now, it wasn't required because salt was such a precious commodity. There were people who said, God, I'm not just going to bring you what you expect. I'm going to salt this sacrifice. And when this burns, I want there to be a distinct aroma in the nostrils of God. I don't want my life to just be the bare minimums of what you expect. But I want this to be a salted sacrifice. And I just wonder tonight on a Tuesday if there's... Anybody here, 
they can say, God, I know that what's required of me, but there is another level of sacrifice and consecration, and I want my life to be something. I want when I come to you, there is an aroma in your presence where you smell the distinction between what I bring and what everybody else brings. That is the difference between casual and radical people. I, I wonder if there's anybody here that can lift your hands right where you are and say, God, this life, this family, this marriage is a salted 